I want to welcome everyone back to LearnNeuroRadiology.com. I'm Brent Weinberg. Today we're going to be going through case five from our brain imaging course. If you haven't seen the other videos in this section, please go back and check those out. Like you're going to see more cases. You're going to see more overall explanations of kind of how things work here. Uh, the interactive course website is available here at LearnNeuroRadiology.com slash brain capstone or this shortened link here if you want to check it out. I'll drop those in the notes below the uh, below the video here. But if you haven't seen those, be sure to check those out. You can follow along with us on the video. Our case today is going to be a 51-year-old woman presenting with left-sided weakness and numbness. All right, so here we are on the website. We're going to have case five. We're going to uh, just open up this uh, case five here. And what we have here is a CT. So here's a head CT. On the left, we have a uh, brain window. On the right, we have a bone window. So we're gonna kind of follow our pattern of going through. We're gonna look at the skull base here, starting with the cerebellum, the posterior fossa. We're looking pretty good so far. Not too bad, not too bad. Everything's kind of looking all right. Pretty tight spaces here, like this right lateral ventricle is a little bit, a little bit smaller. So maybe we're looking for some pathology on the right. And we get up to a little bit higher and we see it looks like some calcification here and very subtle loss of the sulci over here on the right. Uh, so your sulcation pattern is uh, decreased. Maybe if we window this just a little bit, we might be able to tell that maybe there's a rounded mass up here. We're not really sure, but definitely looks swollen. You see how you see the sulci on the left, but not on the right. So this is a problem we definitely uh, want to evaluate with MRI. Now, before we do, though, let's take a look at the bone window here. It looks like maybe there's a little bit too much bone, some erosion of the bone here, some kind of abnormal looking bone there. So we're going to take a look at that uh, with an MRI. So now we've gone back to our case window here. Now we're going to see our brain MRI. We're going to open this up. Uh, here we now have a couple of different sets of images coming up. Over the top left, we have diffusion, we have flare. Uh, this is a T2. Then we've got what looks like pre and post contrast here, a coronal post contrast. So let's uh, let's start off by looking uh, at our diffusion here. You know it's a diffusion because the background has relatively low signal here. Not a lot, not a lot going on there. Nothing really going on in the brain parenchyma here. Again, we see that ventricle is a little bit smaller on that right side. But then we get near the vertex. We've got a pretty hyper intense on diffusion mass here along the right parietal convexity. And so it's definitely bright. Looks like it has a broad dural attachment. So we're going to see that uh, a little bit better on some of our other images. Let's take a look at the flare. Here's our flare. Again, we can kind of jump to the top because we're sort of expecting our abnormality to be near the top. And again, we see a flare hyperintense mass, pretty homogeneous. And with this broad kind of dural attachment, it looks like the brain is smushed away from the mass, which is a little bit important, like because we think it's less likely to be coming from within the brain parenchyma here. Now our T2 can be super helpful on that. So we can see this is a T2. The fluid is really bright. What we're going to see here as we get to this mass, so we get back up here, we see brain parenchyma. And if we look around the mass, we can see a little fissure of CSF around the mass. That's called a CSF cleft. And that's a clue that this is not in the brain parenchyma, but that it's an extra axial mass or something coming from outside the brain parenchyma. And uh, again, if you look up here, this is probably that area of bone that we were seeing that was abnormal on the CT. Maybe you have this little like radial spoke pattern coming out from the portion of the mass that's right along the calvarium there, which can be a useful, a useful sign. Now this is our pre-contrast. Here we have a pre-contrast set of images. It's T1. We know that because the white matter is brighter, brighter than the gray matter here. Probably you can't window it a little bit so you can see that a little bit better. And as we come up, this mass, again, we see it a little bit T1 hypotense compared to the adjacent gray matter in the brain. Uh, but it's pretty similar to the brain, maybe maybe a touch, a touch darker there. But on our post-contrast, we're going to see as we come up higher here, we're going to see again, very homogeneous pretty avidly enhancing, so very bright, very smooth margins. You probably get a little bit of that cleft around the margin. Looks like it's rising from the dura or the extraaxial portion of the brain. And we're going to see that just a little bit better on our coronal, or we're going to get at least another view. So this is a coronal image, so we're looking uh, straight on towards the face. As we come back to the right parietal convexity here, we get into this mass, you see the brain pushed away from the mass itself, broad neural attachment, 
you see these little owl pouchings here. Those are called dural tails. Again, that's a nice clue that what you're looking at is probably coming from the extraaxial space and a little bit of that bone erosion and hyperostosis there, which is very typical for this, for this diagnosis. So let's hop back in and answer our question about this case. So your question here is this lesion intraaxial or extraaxial and how do you know? We already talked about that a little bit. Uh, we looked at it. So here we have a T2, T1 pre-contrast and post-contrast. And you can see on the T2, again, you see that little cleft around the mass. That tells us it's probably extraaxial. We also see the gray matter and the white matter smushed away from the mass, uh, not sort of expanded by the mass. We're thinking this is probably extraaxial. Here's that dural tail that we saw a little bit of before. Again, so probably we're dealing with an extraaxial mass. So then the answer to our questions is, is this lesion intraaxial or extraaxial? We talked about this, it's extraaxial, meaning that it's arising from outside the brain. How do you know? We pointed out that CSF cleft sign there. And so that's your that's your clue that you're dealing with an extraaxial mass. Now, this uh, non-contrast CT, we kind of talked about it, very subtle, even though despite the size, like it was very hard to see here, even when we windowed it kind of tightly, but a pretty isodense mass, a little bit of remodeling of the bone there, a little bit of midline shift, some effacement of that ventricle. And that tells us that we have a mass there and that we definitely wanted to get an MRI to see it uh, a little bit better. Uh, now this patient also had a CTA and uh, we can see uh, you see a little bit of vasculature pushed to the side away from this. But again, we don't see that mass uh, all that well. Now down here, we have a companion case. We have a similar mass. And if you look along the convexity here, you see this cluster of vessels that are kind of centrally within the mass. That's kind of typical for this, for this diagnosis as well. Now on the MRI, we kind of talked about this. We have the T2 cleft sign. We've got avid enhancement. We've got little dural tails. On diffusion, we have diffusion hyperintensity. When we have tumors, most of the time diffusion hyperintensity is coming from cells that are tightly packed together so that uh, water doesn't move that well because the, it's packed together. Now, this uh, etiology usually has hyperperfusion. It can be FDG avid and usually solidly enhancing here. And that kind of spoke wheel pattern that you see a little bit faintly on the T2 is kind of typical for this, uh, for this mass. So what we're dealing with here is a meningioma. A meningiomas can occur anywhere. We have dura, we have meninges. Uh, most of them are intracranial, although you can have them within the spine. You can also have intraventricular meningiomas, which are relatively less common, but can occur in most commonly in the occipital horn. These are commonly adults more than 40 years old, but you can definitely see them in younger patients, particularly if they have a syndrome like nerve fibromatosis. Many times these patients are going to present with symptoms of mass effect or hydrocephalus like headache, paresis. Uh, these are graded from one, two, or three. Uh, grade one is a classic one. Grade two is what we would call an atypical meningioma. Grade three is an anaplastic meningioma. Now these two can have brain invasion or by definition, if a meningioma has brain invasion, it's at least a grade two. We've already talked quite a bit about these imaging findings and you can take a look at that more if you like. These are treated by surgical excision. If they have high risk of recurrence, so if they're grade two or grade three, they'll sometimes irradiate them. If there's a significant residual component, particularly along a critical structure like the optic chiasm or optic nerve, you may even radiate grade one. And then these are gonna be followed up on imaging. Thanks for tuning in today for this case five. We have two more cases left in this uh, course, so be sure to tune back in and check them out. If you haven't checked out the introductory videos in the course, be sure to go back and check those out as well. Thanks for tuning in today.